So I'd like to introduce Dr. Lindy Munson. She is the Public Health Advisor for North Dakota Department of Health and Human Services Immunization Unit. She is a pharmacist and is board certified in pharmacotherapy. She is a lifelong resident of North Dakota and completed her pharmacy education at North Dakota State University. Dr. Munson is a Lieutenant Commander in the United States Public Health Service and served as a pharmacist with Indian Health Service for, the fi for 15 years before transitioning to her role as a public health advisor. Dr. Munson, thank you very much for presenting today. Thank you, Emily. I'm really happy to have this opportunity to talk to everybody today. And I'm really glad that uh, everyone was able to make it. So um, on that note, I will go ahead and get started. I'm gonna turn my camera off just to make it a little easier to see things here. Um, as Emily said, feel free to put questions in the chat. And I think we'll probably have a little time at the end for some questions as well. So what I'm going to be discussing today is I'm gonna give you some immunization updates and um, talk about immunizations and, and vaccines in relation to uh, antimicrobial stewardship. I have no financial relationships to disclose. And our learning objectives today are to discuss recent updates to the adult immunization schedule and to make note of recent updates to the childhood immunization schedule as well to identify the benefits of vaccines in the context of antibiotic stewardship, and to indicate opportunities for pharmacy teams to increase vaccination rates. Which is really a lot to cover in an hour, but I think uh, we'll, we'll be able to manage it. So I'm gonna start with the vaccine updates. And just to level set, um, I'm gonna just kinda give you a, a, little, a little background here of where our updates come from. So the FDA approves medications and vaccines, um, and then it goes to the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, the ACIP, which is a group of medical and public health experts. They hold at least three meetings a year and usually several emergency sessions additionally, especially when a lot's been happening like the past year. And then after they go ahead and meet, then the CDC sets the schedules. So at the ACIP meetings, those are open to the public and allow for public content, or excuse me, comment. They review uh, all the scientific data on the vaccines that are in development or have additional indications. Um, they review effectiveness and other factors and they vote on recommendations. So that is where our public health guidance for the safe use of vaccines and related biological products comes from. Uh, just a side note, when it is biological products, um, there is a drug review division that's involved as well, uh, whereas with most vaccines, it's a vaccine review board that uh, plays a role along the way. And so then, as I said, then the CDC uh, sets the US adult and childhood immunization schedules based on these recommendations. So I'm gonna briefly go over some of the more impactful topics the ACIP discussed in their last several meetings. So first, just a little bit on adult RSV vaccines. So the ACIP approved two vaccines for the prevention of lower respiratory tract disease um, caused by RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, in adults 60 years and older. Um, they are both RSV pre-F vaccines. One is an adjuvanted product and that uh, it goes under the branded name of RxV. And then there's a bivalent product, which is the Abrisvo. Um, and it makes it a little easier since they're so similar in their generic names to refer to them by the brand names. Um, so that's why I bring those up. So with those adult RSV vaccine recommendations that the AACIP made, they did not go ahead and make a universal recommendation with those. Instead, what they did is they made a recommendation um, for adults 60 and over using shared clinical decision making. And what is shared clinical decision making? It is a decision about whether or not to vaccinate um, based on the best available evidence, the individual person being considered and their opinions and preferences, the healthcare provider's clinical discretion, and then the characteristics of the vaccine. 
So there's no default answer in these situations. It is between the patient and the, the healthcare provider, which can be a pharmacist, about whether this is a good option for the patient. So a little bit more about these two vaccines. Uh, both of them were shown to be efficacious for at least one season. Um, the adjuvanted was for um, two seasons that it was studied over and the non-adjuvanted was for one and a half seasons. Each of them, they tested a second dose after 12 months, which was not extremely impactful in either case. They are both very efficacious well after the 12 month point with just one dose. Each had three serious event, adverse events occur during the studies. Um, with the adjuvanted, uh, there was one case of Guillain-Barre and two acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. And then with the uh, bivalent non-adjuvanted, there was two cases of Guillain-Barre and one motor sensory axonal polyneuropathy. And so with, both, with all of those, it was un unknown if it was linked to the vaccine. But the FDA is requiring some post-licensure studies in both cases uh, just to be sure of what the situation actually is there. Uh, both of them also are okay to be co-administered with the flu vaccine. So related to the uh, RSV vaccines for the older adults, which are for 60 and up, is the maternal RSV vaccine. So only one of those products is approved for use in pregnant women, and that is the non-adjuvanted product, um, the Abrisvo product. So with this one, it's unique in that it is a vaccine uh, designed to benefit someone other than the direct recipient. It is for the benefit of the infant, not the mother. So mom receives the vaccine between 32 and 36 weeks gestation. She develops antibodies and through transplacental transfer, they go to the infant for passive immunization. The protection for the infant does take about 14 days after that maternal vaccination. And mom generally doesn't have much in the way of side effects from what, aside from what we usually expect um, with any type of vaccine, minor side effects such as pain at the injection site, headache, et cetera. It can be given at the same time as other recommended vaccines as well. It was found to be extremely effective in preventing severe medically attended RSV-associated lower respiratory tract infections in those infants all the way through 180 days. So that takes all the way through an RSV season. This vaccine is recommended to be given to those women um, at that point in their pregnancy between the months of September and January. Um, so that provides the protection to infants who are born during the RSV season when they are more, most at risk. If this vaccine is received during pregnancy, typically the infant is not going to also require an RSV immunization after birth unless uh, mom got the RSV vaccine and then baby was born less than 14 days later before those antibodies could develop and transfer to the infant or per the clinical judgment of the medical provider um, where they might think the potential incremental benefit is warranted. And there are some uh, pretty specific uh, um, health considerations that they would be looking at in that situation. There were a couple of more significant things that were observed in the studies that I wanna to touch on. So in the studies, Preeclampsia was observed in 1.8% of study participants receiving the RSV vaccine compared to 1.4% who received placebo. So it's a small increase with the vaccine product. It was not statistically significant. There was also a small increase in preterm births observed in the clinical trial. Now during the trial, the vaccine was administered between 24 and 36 weeks gestation compared to so it was earlier uh, in, in the pregnancy when they were giving the vaccine. Um, this also was not statistically significant, but to reduce this possible risk of preterm birth and any complications related to it, uh, when the FDA did their review, they approved the maternal RSV vaccine only for use later in pregnancy between 32 and 36 weeks gestation. So they also are requiring additional studies and it's not, not certain if it's a true safety signal or if it was unrelated to the vaccination. Um, but both of these 
both of these aspects are being under further review, um, even though they, again, were not statistically significant. The next product that got a lot of attention this past year was Nerseva Map, and the trade name on that one is Bayfortis. So this one is a little bit different um, because it is not a vaccine. It's a monoclonal antibody to the RSV Fusion F protein. So this one is for the infant. So it is recommended to be given to infants entering the, who are born during RSV season. So infants born between October and March should receive nirsevimab within the first week of birth if mom did not get the maternal RSV vaccine and if it isn't one of those unique situations where both would be required. Um, some infants entering the second RSV season are also recommended to receive it if they're at higher risk of severe RSV, lower respiratory tract infection. And that would be children with chronic lung disease of prematurity who required medical support any time during the six-month period before the second RSV season, children with severe immunocompromise, children with cystic fibrosis, fibrosis who have manifestations of severe lung disease, and then all American Indian and Alaska Native children. Um, that part of the recommendation was made because in some studies in the Southwest, it was uh, observed that American Indian children had a much higher rate of hospitalization due to RSV, lower respiratory tract infection, um, in the neighborhood of four to 10 times higher. So while, it was, while the study wasn't nationwide, that reflected that um, because of the extreme increase, they included all of those children as being at higher risk. Nirsevimab has an extended serum half-life, so it's one dose for the whole season. So if those babies born during the season within the first week, or if they are born outside of RSV season and they are less than eight months old when entering their first RSV season, they should receive a dose at the beginning of the season. It's weight-based for that first season at 50 milligrams uh, for five kilograms and less, and 100 milligrams for over five kilograms, and a 200 milligram dose for those who receive a second RSV season dose. It can be given at the same time as other recommended immunizations, and it is passive immunization. So just a quick knowledge check. Um, so just to discuss uh, and some things to think about, which statement about nirsevimab is correct? A, nirsevimab is not a vaccine. B, nirsevimab only needs to be dosed once for the RSV season. C, the second season dose of nirsevimab, regardless of weight, is 200 milligrams. Or D, all of the above statements about nirsevimab are correct. And as we discussed on the previous slide, the answer to this one is D, all of those statements are correct. And why, why should RSV vaccines be considered or be given? Why are they important? So each year in the United States, RSV has a pretty significant impact on um, both the very young and on our older adults and on the healthcare system. So we see a lot of hospitalizations in both groups, um, as many as 80,000 in children younger than five and as many as 160,000 hospitalizations in those 65 and older. Uh, it's interesting, you hear a lot about RSV in infants and not so much in older adults, but the impact on those older adults is tremendous with as many as six to 10,000 deaths occurring in that age group related to RSV. Another vaccine that was discussed uh, by the ACIP was the pentavalent meningococcal vaccine. So the FDA approved uh, an, uh, a five-valent vaccine. So for A, B, C, W, and Y in in individuals aged 10 to 25. It's licensed as a two-dose series with a six-month interval between the two doses for ages 10 to 25 years. So the previous recommendations were to receive the quadrivalent, the men ACWY dose, the first dose at 11 to 12 years of the booster at age 16, and then the men B, under shared clinical decision-making, would be two doses at ages 16 to 23 years. With the new recommendations, the pentavalent meningococcal vaccine, which includes all of those from the men ACWY and the men B, 
that can be used when both of those products are indicated at the same visit. So for example, um, you could do at age 11, the quadrivalent, and then at age 16, the pentavalent, and then to follow with that second MenB dose sometime before the age of 23. This vaccine is being included in the VFC program and providers do not have to use this one if they would prefer to not stock it and just use the other two instead. The ACIP workgroup plans to revisit the, men the new meningococcal schedule. Um, probably in February of 2025, they'll be voting on this uh, to discuss things such as whether the 11 to 12 year old dose is still needed given recent epidemiology. They're also gonna discuss shared clinical decision-making for the MenB vaccines and look at an opportunity to reduce the number of vaccines. The ACIP um, discussed the MPOX vaccine recommendations. Currently, they recommend vaccination with the two-dose smallpox and monkeypox vaccine live non-replicating vaccine series. So the trade name on that is Genios. For persons age 18 years and older at risk for MPOX and it is included in the VFC program. So right now, this is an interim recommendation uh, due to some of the outbreaks that we have been seeing, and they're going to revisit this in two to three years. Currently, this vaccine is only available through the federal stockpile, but they anticipate commercializing it sometime in the next several months. There was also discussion of pneumococcal vaccines. So with the pneumococcal vaccines, uh, the PCV20 is recommended as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccination according to the currently recommended dosing on schedules for children aged less than two years in the United States. PCV20 without the PPSV23 is recommended as an option for US children two to 18 years with underlying medical conditions that have increased risk of pneumococcal disease. So basically in, in the children under two, the PCV20 can be used anywhere where, PC, where a PCV vaccine was indicated in the schedule previously. Some other considerations in children under six, if only PCV13 is available, it can be given as previously recommended, or if the series was started with PCV13, it can be completed with either PCV15 or PCV20 without an additional dose or a need to restart. For those older children, six to 18 years with a risk condition who previously received only PCV13, either a dose of PCV20 at least eight weeks later or PPSV23 based on a previous dosing and schedules is recommended. So I tend to find the pneumococcal recommendations to be frequently changing, confusing, and difficult to remember. So just a little side tip, there probably are other ones as well, but I find the Pneumorex app to be very helpful with the pneumococcal recommendations. So influenza vaccines, they mostly looked at some safety findings, um, looking at co-administration uh, during pregnancy or uh, the quadrivalent vaccine during pregnancy and then co-administration. Um, so using the quadrivalent recombinant influenza vaccine during pregnancy, they found that to be safe in, their, in the studies that were conducted. They also found that co-administration of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines along with the quadrivalent inactivated influenza vaccines there were no additional safety concerns uh, with the co-administration versus sequential administration. And then same with co-administration of Zoster recombinant and quadrivalent inactivated influenza vaccines, no safety concerns there either. And so why are influenza vaccines important or why should we think about giving those? So this too has a significant impact on people and on the healthcare system. Uh, people 65 and older, young children, pregnant women, and people with certain health conditions are at higher risk of severe flu complications. Um, during the 22-23 season, there were 300 to 650,000 flu hospitalizations and between 19,000 and 58,000 flu-related deaths. We've heard so much about, about COVID in recent years, but 
flu really does have an impact on the population as well. And in seasons where the vaccine strain composition is considered to be a good match, it can reduce the need for a medical visit by 40 to 60 percent. So when you think about, um, you know, how many thousands of people end up visiting a doctor with flu-related symptoms, if you can cut that in half, that's pretty major. Um, for 22-23, the effectiveness was definitely in that range with 43% of adults being less likely to be hospitalized with a flu illness or related complication and 68% of children being less likely to be hospitalized. ACIP also discussed COVID-19 vaccines and made recommendations to support um, the newly developed monovalent XBB strain containing COVID-19 vaccines as authorized under emergency use authorization or approved by biologics license application in everyone at least six months of age. And at this point also the bivalent vaccines are no longer recommended to be used um, as a go forward with the single monovalent product. They also updated the interchangeability of products depending on the manufacturer. So in certain situations, uh, they had previously recommended that you should stay with the same manufacturer throughout, um, but they have now said that if the same vaccine product is not available at the time of the visit, or if the previous dose manufacturer is unknown, if the person would otherwise not receive a recommended vaccine dose, or if the person started but is unable to complete a series with the same dose or the same product due to a contraindication, an age-appropriate COVID-19 vaccine from a different manufacturer may be administered. Um, the ACIP is scheduled to meet on the 28th and 29th of this month. And one of the things that they may be considering is whether to have an additional dose in older adults or a, a, a booster or secondary XBB strain dose. And with the COVID-19 vaccines, okay, why are those important? Why should we consider them? So the federal public health emergency declaration may have ended in May of 2023, but COVID is definitely still around. So what this graphic represents is new hospital admis admissions uh, related to COVID-19 by week in the United States. And so we can see that there are still a pretty significant number. We had a little spike in earlier in January and it's coming down a little bit. Um, but we're still, you know, uh, above 20,000 new hospital admissions weekly. So COVID is still around. Uh, it's here with us and it's still making people sick. People are still dying from it. If we look at North Dakota specifically, uh, you know, we can see the same type of thing that we're still having new cases. Although with so much home testing, the new cases or positivity on that um, is probably low estimates. But we can see... COVID hospitalizations in North Dakota facilities also um, trended up uh, through January. Another thing that they discussed related to COVID vaccines is what they call the Bridge Access Program. And what this is, is a program um, developed to ensure that there is no cost and timely access to all of the CDC recommended COVID-19 vaccine vaccines after the vaccine went, was commercialized in 2023. Um, with the commercialization, it changed things a little bit. Uh, you know, it, it, it isn't as readily, it isn't everywhere free all the time. It isn't quite that simple. It is now being covered on people's insurance and uh, places supplying it often have to pay for it versus just getting it free from the government. But this makes sure that the 25 to 30 million uninsured and underinsured adults 18 years and older can continue to receive COVID-19 vaccine at no charge. It expands the access points to healthcare providers, um, federally supported health centers, and there are pharmacies participating in the program as well. Now, this is 18 years and older, um, under eight or 18 and younger would have access to the COVID vaccines at no charge through the Vaccines, vaccines for Children program. Um, so this is 
just COVID-19 vaccines, but it still continues to make it available to those who don't have access. The program is scheduled to end by the end of this year, December 31st, 2024, but it, there is a possibility it's being extended. They implemented this program as a bridge um, while they're working on developing um, a vaccines for adult program. Ideally, we would see some type of program for adult coverage on vaccines like we have with children, but there's a lot to be worked out to get that in place. Another big topic was the 2024 immunization schedule. So as I mentioned, um, the ACIP reviews and votes to approve these schedules and then the CDC endorses them basically. Um, the 2024 schedules include new products such as Nercevimab, maternal RSV vaccine, um, MPOX vaccine existed, but the recommendations are, are new to this schedule. PCV20 recommendations, updated COVID-19 vaccines, and, and there were other changes as well. So I'm just gonna pop up on the screen so you can see them, what the immunization schedules look like. So starting with the child and adolescent schedule, still child and adolescent, still child and adolescent, still child and adolescent, and the adult schedule. And that one continues as well. So you can see that they are both lengthy and complex, but they are an excellent resource for determining patient vaccine needs. Um, they have a lot of notes that, uh, that account for special circumstances. And so they are a really good resource. So just another quick knowledge check. Which of these vaccines had a recommendation update in the 2024 adult immunization schedule? A, MPOX vaccine, B, maternal RSV vaccine, C, PCV20, or D, all of the above. And based on the topics we have just discussed, the answer to that one is D, all of the above, had a recommendation update in the 2024 adult immunization schedule. Other topics that were discussed at recent ACIP meetings include RSV vaccine adults aged 50 to 59. So as mentioned previously, their recommendation was based on shared clinical decision-making and adults 60 and up. Um, but they did discuss, you know, what the impact would be for 50 to 59. They didn't make any votes or recommendations. They discussed the live chikungunya vaccine and possible recommendations for travelers, laboratory workers, and outbreak response. Again, no vote on that. There was discussion of the dengue vaccine, um, but about midway through the year, uh, app the application for approval is pulled by the manufacturer on that one. So that one at this point um, is not under consideration any longer. And then for pneumococcal vaccine, there is a PCV21 with anticipated licensure in the first half of 2024. So there was some brief discussion on that as well. So those are topics that probably will continue to be discussed going forward. And now shifting gears a little bit to vaccines and antibiotic stewardship. So to put it very simply, vaccines equal less infections, less infections equal less antibiotics, less antibiotics equal less antibiotic resistance. Very, very simplified. So vaccines can do many things in the realm of antibiotic stewardship. They can avoid potential unnecessary or suboptimal antibiotic prescribing. Um, studies have shown that as many as 30% of all patient antibiotic prescriptions are inappropriate or unnecessary. They can avoid treatment failures. So if an antibiotic um, is uh, not the most optimal, or if it isn't uh, completed in the optimal way, you can have a treatment failure can avoid patients experiencing antibiotic side effects and ultimately avoid the emergence and or spread of antibiotic resistant organisms and avoid related healthcare burden. So each year, more than 2.8 million antimicrobial resistant infections occur in the United States 
and more than 35,000 people die as a result. These data from the National Healthcare Safety Network reflect inpatient antimicrobial resistance. So there are vaccines available to prevent diseases caused by both bacteria and viruses. So with bacteria, um, some of the vaccine preventable diseases are caused by Bordetella pertussis as part of the Tdap vaccine. Um, also included in that is protection against uh, diphtheria and tetanus. Um, streptococcus pneumoniae, we see vaccines for that as we've already discussed. Neisseria meningitidis, so the meningococcal vaccines. And then Hib, Haemophilus influenza type B, vaccine for that as well. And then in addition to preventing some of those diseases, the vaccines can also reduce the complications um, of these diseases should people contract them, which can include other bacterial infections. So in all of these cases, if the vaccine prevents these, antibiotics would not be needed. And then vaccine preventable, preventable viral disease can lead to secondary bacterial infections. For example, chickenpox complications can include skin infections, lung infections, and sepsis. Influenza can also lead to lung infections and sepsis as well as ear infections. So while antibiotics are gonna help with the viral diseases themselves, antibiotics might be needed for those secondary bacterial infections. Antimicrobial resistance occurs when a disease causing microbe develops the ability to survive exposure to a previously effective antimicrobial agent through genetic changes. And according to the World Health Organization, this is one of the top global public health threats that's developing currently. It makes treating infections more challenging and makes medical procedures riskier because with those medical procedures, you know, if there's a risk of infection and then there's a risk of an infection that has fewer options antibiotic wise that it's going to be susceptible to, it increases the risk. So there's different numbers out there on this, but it's likely that antimicrobial resistance is responsible for at least seven hundred several hundred thousand deaths globally every year. And some studies anticipate that this is going to increase to 10 million annually by 2050 at the rate that we're seeing antimicrobial resistance develop. For example, in 2022, the median rate of third generation cephalosporin resistant E. coli was 42% and methicillin resistant Staph aureus or MRSA was 35% among 76 reporting countries. And so those are very prevalent bacteria and, and to see reduced opportunities for treatment, that's definitely something that we need to look at and try and do something about. So as far as bacterial products or bacterial diseases, for example, with Hib, starting in the 1970s, Hib resistance to beta-lactam and antibiotics began increasing until at the end of the 90s, over 16% of all Hib strains were beta-lactamase positive. Once the Hib polysaccharide and conjugate vaccine int was introduced in the U.S., invasive Hib in children less than five years of age decreased by 99%. So this was a dramatic impact on the prevalence of Hib and the need for those antibiotics. With Streptococcus pneumoniae or Strep pneumo, prior to the vaccine development, it had become resistant to three drug, drug classes. Once the pneumococcal polysaccharide, polysaccharide conjugated vaccines were introduced. It decreased the number of cases in children less than five years of age and re reduced bacterial antibiotic resistance. So universal PCV coverage is estimated to be able to decrease annual antibiotic usage in, in children less than five years of age 
by 11.4 million days of antibiotic usage if it was used universally, if everyone got it. So the potential there is just tremendous. It's already had a significant impact, but there's still opportunity. And then in 2007, 2008, our very own North Dakota Department of Health identified a ciprofloxacin resistant Neisseria meningitidis in North America. There are also a lot of other opportunities out there. Currently, there are researchers in Minnesota working on developing a vaccine that targets the iron receptor proteins of E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae, two bacterial pathogens that cause most urinary tract infections. So we've got a lot of tools out there already and there will be more to come. And so it's kind of exciting to think, you know, how many um, UTI infections there are and how common antibiotic usage is for those UTIs, possible vaccine products to prevent against that would be just a huge impact uh, to people's health and to the healthcare system. So viral vaccines have a direct impact because they prevent serious viral respiratory tract infections and subsequent inappropriate antibiotic prescribing, and then indirect because they prevent the development of secondary bacterial infections requiring antibiotic treatment. With the influenza vaccine, on average, nearly 14 outpatient visits related to influenza can be avoided for every 1,000 people vaccinated. And then according to a systematic review, influenza vaccine can reduce related antibiotic usage by almost one third. So another quick knowledge check. According to a systematic review, influenza vaccination can reduce antibiotic usage by about how much? A, influenza vaccination will not reduce antibiotic usage. B, 10%, C, 33%, D, 100%. And the answer that we just had on the last slide was C, 33% or by, by about one third. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is pharmacy vaccine opportunities. So what opportunities are there for pharmacies, pharmacists, pharmacy technicians related to vaccines? Numerous, there's just a ton of opportunities out there. So these are some of the ways that pharmacies can get involved um, in a hospital pharmacy. So is there a facility antibiotic stewardship effort or team um, that a pharmacist can be involved in or pharmacy can be involved in? They can also reassess antibiotic therapy and make recommendations. Is the antibiotic being used? What the one that's still needed now that are their cultures back or their sensitivities? Could it be downgraded to a a less broad spectrum antibiotic. And long-term care facilities or nursing homes. Pharmacists can engage in medication regimen review and make recommendations as they can in hospital settings. They can also conduct antibiotic use data reporting and you know, evaluate how antibiotics are being used and present that information to the prescribing providers. In the retail setting, pharmacists can be active in many ways as well. They can verify allergies. Sometimes those can slip through the gaps and the pharmacist has, has an opportunity to catch that and prevent an adverse impact. Retail pharmacies can offer immunizations. They can provide those vaccines to their patients. And they can also get involved in the VFC program. In North Dakota, as things stand, pharmacists can vaccinate ages three and up. And so that VFC program um, expands the opportunity for the those eligible, which would be uninsured, underinsured, meaning that they have insurance, but which doesn't fully cover vaccines, uh, Medicaid eligible, or American Indian or Alaska Native patients have access to those those vaccines. So on the last slide was some of the um, was some of the ways in which a pharmacy can be involved, and this slide is some of the why you want to be involved. So just to name a few, I mean, 
You can use your, your education, your licensure to provide more comprehensive patient care. You can be part of that, um, that care team that takes care of the whole patient and all of their health care needs and not just, um, not just get it, helping them get their medications and being on the reactive end, but be on the proactive end and help them with their preventative health care. You can also further your trust relationship with patients and their families. Um, pharmacists are a trusted point of medical information for many people still in a time where misinformation and disinformation is getting more and more prevalent. Pharmacists are readily accessible to patients um, with most, I think it's something like 95% of patients are within five miles of a pharmacy, something like that nationwide. So it's a really uh, readily available resource and an opportunity to get to know your patients and their families and their needs a little bit better. You can make healthcare easier for patients. It's, it's sometimes hard for patients to, to get in to places to get a vaccine, but you know, if, if, if a pharmacy is located in a convenient location and they're there anyway, picking up medications, they can just get those taken care of or um, you know, one less place to stop or one more, one less place to take their children. You can contribute to a healthier community. Along with utilizing that education and licensure, you know, it can increase job satisfaction. You can draw a meaning from being able to contribute to your patient's health care, their wellness versus, versus their illness care. And then on the other side of that, you can generate pharmacy revenue. Um, billing for vaccine administration is a definite opportunity to increase the dollars coming into the pharmacy. And then lastly, you can make a difference. Uh, you can make a difference for yourself, for your patients, and for the community. So that's kind of the overall, you can make a difference. And then just to um, spell this out a little bit more clearly, about why? Well, as you can see, looking at the slide of North Dakota influ influenza rates that comes from the North Dakota Inf Immunization Information System or the NDIS, it's broken down by age groups and it reflects the various um, influenza seasons going back to the 2017-18 season. And it shows the percent in each of those groups who received at least one dose of the influenza vaccine for that season. So our 65 year and older group is by far the highest, but they still are under 60% and they are at pretty significant risk of complications from influenza. Our 18 to 49 year olds are very low, sitting around 20%. So there's a lot of opportunity here to, to reach people and to educate them on on influenza and on vaccines and on, on the need for it. Looking at the Shingrix vac vaccination rates in North Dakota. So the lower line is, is people who receive both doses. The upper line is they've received one dose of the two dose series. And it's been steadily increasing, but there's still um, a long ways to go. I mean, it's it's recommended for 50 and up, but we're sitting at around 40%. And Medicare Part D now covers all ACIP recommend vac recommended vaccines with a $0 copay. So especially in your 65 and up, that's a real opportunity to protect people from a very, very uncomfortable um, infection and any sequelae that might result from that and without them having any out of pocket. And finally looking at the COVID-19 vaccination rates. So when we look at this um, blue column with at least one of the 20, one dose of the 2023-2024 XBB variant vaccine, the numbers overall are low, and this is nationwide, it's not just North Dakota, but even in our 65 and older population who had at least one dose of the 
previous to this, um, they were at about 80%. For this product, for this newest dose, it's only a little over 30% of them have gotten it. And they are the group that's at the highest risk for complications. Um, also, you know, with that bridge program, everyone has access to this. So it's something to keep in mind that our patients are not as protect protected as well as they could be. So another knowledge check, which statement below is false? A, pharmacists can contribute to antibiotic stewardship efforts through offering immunizations. B, only hospital pharmacists can contribute to antibiotic stewardship efforts. C, pharmacists have access to patients to provide education. And D, pharmacists can screen patients' vaccine statement. So the correct answer or the false answer is B, only hospital pharmacists can contribute to antibiotic stewardship efforts. Pharmacists can contribute by offering immunizations. They have access to patients to provide education and they can screen patients' vaccine status. So with that, that brings me to the end of my presentation. And I'll just pop up the, the instructions for claiming continuing education. Um, but if anyone has any questions, if there's anything in the chat or if anyone wanted to come off mute to ask any questions. Lindy, we do have two questions. Great. The first one is, can pharmacists make the official shared clinical decision-making? And if so, where should this be documented? So that's gonna, the documentation aspect is going to vary depending on where you practice. But yes, pharmacists can do that. And I assume we're talking about um, the RSV vaccine for the older adults 60 and older, the OREXV and Obrisbo. So yes, pharmacists are considered healthcare providers in that context and can make that shared clinical decision-making with the patient. 